What I want to do first is to um, to thank a couple of people. First, Deb Nelson for having invited me. I'm very appreciative of being here. And Dave Levy, an old friend who not only helped to bring me here, but also is the chairman of our Global Trauma Relief Program, and his generosity uh, company has made a significant donation to our work with war and disaster traumatized people. So thank you, Dave, and thank you very much. I've also, I have to say, I've been learning so much. You know, it's really interesting. When you, when you speak a lot, sometimes you don't listen as much as you might. Anybody ever notice something? <laughs> uh, this, this morning, I have been listening very carefully. And first of all, enjoying the music. And second of all, enjoying and being moved by the presentations and by the energy and power and commitment and willingness to take a risk of the people whom I've heard speaking, and also the number of other people whom I met here since I arrived last night. So I feel like I'm in the right place with kindred spirits, and I recognize, I recognize many of the same qualities in many of you that, that I see in myself and I see in this work, even though the content and the field that we're working in may be rather different. There's many similarities. I hope you'll see that too. Now, uh, as Laurie said, my work for nearly 45 years has been focused, first of all, on people in difficult situations. Uh, I've always been interested in how people manage to deal with some of the most terrible situations on, on the planet. From the time I was a kid growing up in New York City and meeting in the course of life in New York City, people who were in some very difficult situations. And what I've also noticed is that sometimes great wisdom and powerful transformation could come out of those difficult situations. So when I had a chance to, uh, in medical school, when I had a chance to work with a population, I chose to work with autistic children. I was really interested to see if you go in a place in one of those kind of dark and removed places where many of these kids seem to live, what, what, not only could I be helpful to them, but just about as important is there something they had to teach me. And so that's been a consistent theme uh, of my work, is working with people uh, who are going through difficult times working with them really as partners and seeing what we can do to create a situation in which there is, uh, as one of my teachers, Roddy Lang, R.D. Lang, who some of you may know or have heard of, said, uh, he describes psychotherapy as the alternate attempt of two people to discover the wholeness of being human between them. So for me, all the work that I do with other people is, is a coming together. It's not me treating or me being here, except that somebody breaks an arm and I have to set the arm or sew up a wound or something like that. But for the most part, in working with other people, it's really creating a partnership. Now the context also for this 40 years of work, or 45 years of work, is also the growing understanding that for most of the problems that most of us have, there are no simple, easy solutions, no magic bullets in, in medicine, in healthcare, in mental health. That the solutions lie largely within us and between us. That is, most of us are, will be afflicted by chronic illness, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, depression, anxiety, and what we're learning, the more we pursue those quick technological fixes, the more we see that they really don't work. Of course, if you're hit by a truck, they're great. If you have an overwhelming infection, if you need to have your gallbladder out, but for most of the problems that most of us have, most of the time, the answers are going to come from within.
within us. And they're going to come between us. Simple things like dealing with stress, working with diet, working with exercise and movement, creating communities of support, finding meaning and purpose in our lives. Now all of that is the subject of another talk. What I'm going to focus on today is how we bring that approach to one group of people with which my colleagues and I at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine have been working increasingly over the last 15 years, and that is whole populations that are traumatized by war, by terrorism, by natural disaster, as well as by ongoing poverty. So I want to give you just a little bit of a feeling for this work. And what I want to say to you is that the lessons that we may be learning out there in places like Gaza, Haiti, or Kosovo, or Macedonia, that those same lessons are lessons we all need to be learning in our own lives. That the trauma that comes to people there also comes to us. So I'm going to show you some slides, talk some about trauma, maybe give you a couple of little experiences of what we do. And then tomorrow afternoon, for those who would like to learn more, there'll be a whole, whole workshop of this as well, um, using meditation. Because this model is essentially a meditative model. Meditative of education. I'll come back to that. Okay. So first is this extraordinary quote from Franz Kafka. You can hold yourself back from the sufferings of the world. That is something you are free to do, and it accords with your nature. But perhaps this very holding back is the one suffering you could avoid. Mm -hmm. So the message is very clear to me, and I see it reflected in some of what I view as a kindred spirit of Kafka, that in not holding back, we are relieving not only perhaps the suffering of others, but also a certain amount of our own suffering. So I invite you all to not hold back. You heard that? So lay down your burdens. And those burdens really are often the things that hold us back from doing what we can do and being who we can be. Now this is a picture of a town in a cemetery in a town called Kushimala in Kosovo. And uh, this is after the war, 1998, 1999 war. And these are graves, and about one quarter of this town these were killed during the war. And this is some this is the kind of thing that is happening in too many places around the world. And when it happens, I love this quote from a, a friend uh, in Kosovo. There's nobody normal here anymore. That if there's enough trauma, enough disturbance, all of us are going to be disturbed, no matter how resilient, how smart, how much advantage we've had, it's going to come to us as well. I think it's really important to remember. This is uh, bringing it home. This is a picture of one of the family members of a child who was killed in uh, Sandy Hook, who we're working now as well. And this is a picture you probably have all seen the Boston Marathon following the ball. And it's obviously, this is not only happening, these kinds of events that are so widely publicized are in some ways common places in some of the neighborhoods in our cities, in our country. You don't read about them on the front page of the paper, we hardly read about them even in the metro section. But they're happening every day. And kids who are growing up in these neighborhoods are being exposed to scenes like this on a regular basis. So the trauma is there at this level, this dramatic level, but it also is there in all of our lives. Trauma's Greek word means injury. It may come, it is going to come to all of us at one point or another. These are some of the more obvious causes of trauma. 
I, I want to mention just, just these last few because it's really important to understand that when somebody has an ominous diagnosis, that becomes a traumatic event. And it needs to be dealt with, with the kind of understanding that we would deal with somebody who had suffered in one of these catastrophes. Also, the treatment of, of us, and this is, this is, this is both across social class, goes across race, the treatment in the healthcare system is often even more traumatic than the illness itself. And some of you may have experienced this in your families or in your professional life. And it needs to be understood in that way. And finally, that working with people who are traumatized uh, is itself puts a spring on all of it. It's beautiful work, and it also creates its own kind of trauma. In the literature, they call it secondary trauma. Now, this is some of the statistics. It says 82 percent have experienced at least one traumatic event. I would say eventually it's going to be 100 percent. We're all in this together. One of the things that statistics I have on another slide that I don't have here is that one of the groups that is very severely traumatized and is going to present, is already beginning to present a major, not only public health, but a major sort of moral and spiritual problem for all of us, is the men and women coming back in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there are estimates, in fact they've stopped making estimates in the last couple of years because the Defense Department's a little uneasy about it. But the most recent estimates were that about 600,000 are going to come back with post-traumatic stress disorder or major depression and another 300,000 400,000 with traumatic brain injury. So this is, a, this is a major crisis, and these people are, many of them, becoming dysfunctional and distressing not only to themselves, but to their families and communities. So, and and they, they need to be attended to, because whether we oppose the war or agree with the war, they were sent over in our name. And there are brothers and sisters, and we have to reach out to them, and that's one of the projects that we're very much engaged in doing. Now, anybody know what this is? What's that? Mustard seed. Um, now, this is to remind me to tell you a story. Uh, it's a story uh, about a woman whose baby died and who comes to Buddha 2,500 years ago. And she says, I understand, I know you're a great spiritual teacher, I understand you're also a great healer. And remember that Ab originally, spiritual teachings and healing went together. Spiritual teachers were the physicians of their communities, whether you call them a shaman, wise woman, witch doctor, a friend of mine in Mozambique calls himself a doctor witch, <laughs> that they were the healers, and, and Buddha was renowned as a healer. And she brings this baby to him, and she says, can you bring him back to life? And he looks at her, and he says, yes, it can be done. But first, I want you to bring me a mustard seed from a house that has not suffered the way you are suffering now. And in India, where Buddha lived, mustard seeds are in every house. They always cook with mustard seeds. So she was elated. She said, OK. And she went around one house, another house. For three days, she went to every house in the village. And she came back without a mustard seed. She put her head down, and she said, yes, I understand. I understand, and I accept. Now, that level of understanding and acceptance is so deep, and the 
best we can do to come at it is so necessary for all of us. This is just to say, we've all, just to remind ourselves, if we need a reminder of trauma that we have experienced, that we're all in this together, whoever we may be. The question is, what can we do? And the first thing is to relax and be present. When I went up with some of my team to Sandy Hook in Newtown and met with about 30 doctors and clinicians who were working with the families who lost children, working with the first responders, working with the teachers in the schools, working with the families whose kids were somehow miraculously spared what's called the survivors of the families. They said to me, how do you relate to somebody who's just lost a six-year-old child? What do you do? I'm overwhelmed. I get anxious. What do I do? So I said, the first thing you do is relax. Because if you can relax and be present with that person, first be present with yourself, and then be present with that person, then something is possible. As long as you're agitated, as long as you're trying to make something happen, you're out of touch. You can't be completely. So I'm going to teach you a very simple technique that we use, that we teach everywhere to go. So sit comfortably, if you would. And perhaps notice that you've changed your position when I say sit comfortably. <laughs> Now, partly that's because you're perhaps listening and eager and moving forward, but it's a all good reminder. We often don't sit or stand or move in ways that are comfortable. Allow your breathing to deepen. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. It's a very relaxing way to breathe. Maybe a little unfamiliar. Great. How many people notice a change? Raise your hand from before to after. Beautiful. <coughs> Same thing happens in the middle of a war. Same thing happens after a disaster. What you see, what everyone is able to see in five minutes, is that it is possible to change your physiology a little bit, maybe you feel a little more relaxed, shoulders more relaxed, a little more centered, vision a little clearer. Not only can you experience the change, which is hopeful, but you are doing it yourself. You have the power in a situation in which everything seems and is often totally out of your control to make a difference. This is the beginning of hope for all of us. It's the beginning of hope whether you're working as a therapist with somebody who's lost a child, or whether you're a, a, a woman in Haiti whose home has been destroyed and half of whose family is dead. It is some hope that at least for a moment it is possible to be calm, to be relaxed, to be present, and that things can change. I don't have much time. Second part is reaching out to others. Story again. Can I have a little bit more time? Okay. Yeah. okay. This is a young man named Rebot, also from Kosovo. During the war, war of liberation from mm -hmm. Serbia, he was too young. Two minutes. Ah, okay. Uh, he was too. He felt he was too old to flee with his family. And the Kosovo Liberation Army thought he was too young to fight. So by day he had to hide out, otherwise he would have been murdered because he was a male and the Serbs were killing all adolescent males and all adult males. By night he buried the bodies of the dead. After the war, he went from being an A student to just about failing, couldn't concentrate, uh, withdrew from other kids at night, 
he had dreams of hands reaching out from the grave to pull him into the grave. He told me this, and I said, we fuck. I'm meeting with a group of your fellow students. Uh, when you come into this group, so I was meeting with about 20 kids in the high school in Kosovo. And so he sat on my right, and we went around, and everybody introduced themselves, as we do. We work in groups, people coming together, as human beings always have, just the way we are at the stables, group of eight or 10 people. And everybody introduced themselves. I'm so-and-so, my house was destroyed. I'm so-and-so, my father was killed. So-and-so, I saw my sister murdered. And so and so, I was molested, by which she meant raped by the Serbian paramilitaries. I came around to him and he was smiling. And he said, My classmates, I'm not laughing at you. I am smiling because for the first time since the war, I feel like I am not so weird. I'm not so different. You have been through what I have been through. And I feel it is possible for me to once again be part of my class be part of you. So here is after the group. And I have more hair then. Uh, <laughs> research, basically you can read about this. Essentially what I'm saying here is that these techniques that we use, the techniques of self-awareness and self-care, can change brain physiology and can change the structure of our brain. We can create more brain cells in areas that are important to judgment, to compassion for others, uh, as researched by Sarah Lazar. And we can also potentially lengthen our lives. This is research on telomeres that shows that uh, these telomeres shorten. When they're shortened, often by stress, they can shorten your life. When they're lengthened by meditation and other techniques, and they will be able to lengthen your life. So let me just I'm going to do one other thing. This research you can read about. This is research showing that our model, using meditation, movement, dance, drawings, written exercises, guided imagery, and sharing in groups, we've been shown we're able to lower post-traumatic stress by 90% in people who've been traumatized by war, and that those gains largely hold the research done in Kosovo and Belgium. There's more recent research from the New York Times, which is mentioned in the New York Times, hasn't quite come out yet. But this is possible with our veterans as well. I'm going to close in a moment, but I want to tell you one brief story and ask you to stand up with me while I tell you the story. Okay? The reason I'm having you do this and taking, impinging a little bit on lunch is because what I want to say to you is that where we began with this idea of being present with other people, being present to what's happening now the way so many of you are, certainly in the work that I've been hearing about and hopefully in your lives, can be profoundly healing and that it comes, as the song we sang earlier about inspiration, that it comes sometimes from we know not where. I was, several weeks ago, uh, in a refugee camp in Jordan, working with Syrian refugees. There's a catastrophe going on in Syria. Uh, probably 80,000 people dead by now. 500,000 have fled to Jordan. Everybody has suffered tremendously. I'm in a refugee camp, and in a tent there, and there are a group of guys, and one young man is standing off to the side. Nice looking young guy. Somehow he had a pressed shirt and pressed pants. How do you manage that in a refugee bed? Totally good on me. But every once in a while you see that. But he's standing off to the side, and I said something to him. I said, What's going on with you? And he said, I'm very disturbed. And I said, How come? He said, Well, um, I was. Uh, in prison for 10 months, and I was tortured every day while I was in prison. I said, what did they do? They hung me up and they beat me, and then they put electrodes here, and he pointed to his genitals and there. He said, and now I think about it every night, I dream about it, um, and I can't concentrate on anything, and I don't want to be around anybody, which is why I'm standing off to the side. I 
said, what did you do before you were arrested? He said, I was a student. What were you studying? And he said, hospitality industry. Oh, wow. He said, oh, OK. What do you learn they like to do? What's your favorite thing to do? He said, cook. He said, beautiful. Cooks are experimentalists, right? You like experiments. Little tiny smile. He said, OK, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to laugh. He said to me, there is nothing to laugh about. I haven't laughed. I said, well, are you willing to do the experiment and to see? See if something can happen. Because right now, the torturers had you for 10 months. Now you're in Jordan, but they still have you. Every night, they come back, and they haunt your dreams. You've got to free yourself from it. And maybe, maybe this little technique will help. So I said, and by this time, a whole tent full of men have gathered around. Because they, they're curious. They want to know that anything will help them. So I said, we're going to laugh, and I'm going to show you how to laugh, and then we're going to laugh for a minute or so together. Laughter is like this. Thank you. Let it fly.